Hello everybody, it's Mr. Tall 23 back with another video. In this video, I want to wrap up and finish the videos that I've been doing in the last few days and kind of just uh, tie it all together and just do a quick last message about uh, what I've been talking about in the last couple of videos about free grace theology and about the fact that we are saved by Greeks through faith alone and that we're not saved by our works or by uh, going to church or getting baptized or doing these rituals or repenting of your sins or whatever. But all of our uh, our salvation and our justification and eternal life and all of that all comes from believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. So, based on what we've seen in the last couple videos from the scriptures, going through all those verses that say that if you believe, you're justified, you are born again, you are quickened, we can conclude that we are saved by grace through faith alone. This is salvation. Now remember, at the introduction of this discussion in the first video, I said that the Bible says that we are saved from three things. From our sin, from the wrath of God, and from death. And two of those, the wrath of God and death, are the result of sin. The reason why Jesus came into this world, according to 1 Timothy 1.15 and 1 John 4.14, uh, was to save us from our sins, to save sinners. And by extent, that saves us from the consequences of our sins as well, which would be the wrath of God, according to Romans chapter 2, verses 8 to 9, and that is expressed by the damnation of hell and the lake of fire. So the angel Gabriel said to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, And, he, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So remember, Jesus is the salvation of God. He has come to be our Savior, and... That, mean that he, means that he has come to save us from our sins. And how this took place, we have already abundantly shown from the scriptures that Jesus died for our sins, he rose again for our justification, he made his offering of his body and blood in the holy place in heaven once for all, and justifies all those that believe, then regenerates all those that believe, then quickens all those that believe with everlasting life. And therefore our salvation from our sins and from the wrath of God and from hell, is attained not by our own works of righteousness, but by our faith. If we ask ourselves, what do we need to do to be saved from our sins? The answer is plain in the Bible. In Acts chapter 16, verse 31, it says, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. This was in response to the question made by the jailer at Philippi, who says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And their answer is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Why? Because through trusting in Jesus Christ, through putting your faith in him, our sins are forgiven, as we've seen in the scriptures. We are made the righteousness of God. Our spirit is regenerated into a new creature. We are born of God and without sin, and our dead soul is made alive with everlasting life. And we are predestinating according to the foreknowledge of God, to be raised up and glorified on the last day. All of these things take place, and therefore we are saved from our sin and its consequences. All of these things take place through faith. Now, the Roman Catholic Church says that faith isn't enough. They say you also need to be baptized, and you need to participate in the sacrament of penance, and you need to participate in communion, and you need to obey the Ten Commandments and join the Catholic Church and do all these rituals and prayers and obey the Ten Commandments to get yourself out of hell and their, uh, myst and their mythical purgatory, okay? The Lutherans say that faith in Christ isn't enough. They say you also have to be baptized in order to wash away your sins. The Methodists say faith in Christ isn't enough. After you believe, you must then grow in your faith and be sanctified, and if you fall away, you can perish everlastingly. Even though Jesus said in John 10, 28, that those that have eternal life shall never perish. Or in J John three sixteen, he says that those that believe will not perish. The churches of Christ say that faith isn't enough. They say you must believe and then repent of your sins and then be baptized and then continue to serve God and endure to the end and then you'll be saved. The Mormons say faith isn't enough. They say you have to believe and be baptized and repent of your sins and obey all the ordinances of the Mormon church to obtain full salvation. But the Bible says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It does not say you might be saved. It does not say probably you shall be saved. It doesn't say believe and be baptized and repent of your sins and do this and do that 
in order to be saved. It says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's it. There's nothing else, okay? It doesn't say you have to do anything else except believe. And we've seen so many other scriptures that say it is by faith and that it's not of our works. It is not by the deeds of the law. It is not by this. It's not by that. It's all by faith is what the Bible says over and over again. Jesus and his apostles taught, as we've seen in dozens and dozens of verses in these last couple videos, that it is through faith, without works, that we are justified, regenerated, and quickened. So if you believe, God's grace is upon you, and you have been saved. That's what the Bible teaches. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5, Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. And then a few verses later, verses 8 to 9, it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So God's gift of salvation and eternal life is only given when we receive the gift by faith. Yet we don't earn it through our works because then it wouldn't be a gift and then it wouldn't be by grace. Remember Romans 11 chapter, or Romans chapter 11 verse 6. It shows that there's no mixing between grace and works. So it clearly states in verse 9 that it's not by our works. But in verse 8, it says we receive it by grace. That is, that's entirely part from works, okay? If it were of grace, then it's no more works, according to Romans 11, verse 6. The Bible says it is the grace of God that bringeth salvation. So we are saved by grace, meaning we don't have to work for it. The only way that we receive that gift is through trusting in God, by having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, we are saved by grace, not of works, not by our own works of righteousness, which we have done. Okay, but by grace and through faith alone. Those who believe, those who trust in God and not in themselves, are those that shall inherit eternal life. Okay? So those who are trusting in their works and their own righteousness and their own goodness and their own deeds and obedience and repentance of sins and every other thing that is of themselves, if they are not trusting in Jesus Christ, if they are trusting in anything else, whether it be the good things that they do, whether it be their baptism or going to church or their obedience, they will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. As Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have not we prophesied in thy name? In thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me ye that work iniquity. Now this is ironically a scripture that's twisted by the self-righteous false gospel religions to teach the opposite of what it actually says. They ignore verses 22 and 23 and focus on verse 21, where Jesus says that only those that do the will of the Father shall enter into the kingdom. However, what they fail to realize is that nobody completes the perfect will of God in the sense that they interpret that. You have to understand the context of this passage, okay? This is part of the Sermon on the Mount, in which Jesus is emphasizing the necessity of perfection for those who think that they will get to heaven by their own deeds. He said at the beginning, that except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, that you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Then he said, as I read in the first video in Matthew 5.48, Be ye therefore perfect, as my Father which is in heaven is perfect. Because God looks for perfection. Any sin, anything that goes against his will is enough to damn you. That is why we need justification by faith in Christ. Because none of us are perfect. So we can't get through, we can't get to heaven through our own works and our own obedience. Okay, but these people talked about in verse 22. They come to Jesus boasting of the things that they've done and boasting of their good works. Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. These are not people who once were justified but had lost their salvation, as some people try to twist this passage into saying, because Jesus says, I never knew you. So why were these people cast out? Okay, Because Jesus said, I never knew you, meaning they've never been his people. It's not that they were saved and they lost their salvation. Why are they cast out of the kingdom of heaven? Why are they not allowed to enter? Because their trust is not in Christ, but in their own works. And that's what we see in verse 22. And so therefore, they remain unjustified. Christ calls them workers of iniquity because they have not had their sins forgiven. They come to Jesus thinking that they're righteous, thinking that they will get to heaven because they call him Lord and have submitted unto him and are doing things in his name. Okay? They've 
called him Lord and they're serving him. They're doing works in his name, right? But because they're boasting in that, and that is what they're trusting in in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, because they're lifting themselves up instead of seeking mercy and turning to God by faith, that's why they're cast out. They're still under condemnation because they seek to be justified by the law. It says in Romans chapter 9 that the reason why the Jews did not attain to righteousness is because they sought it by the works of the law. It says in Galatians 5.4 that Christ has become of no effect to those who are justified by the law. So every religion, no matter if they claim to be Christians, who thinks that they will enter into heaven because of their own works and deeds, every religion that teaches that is deceived. And Christ does not know them, okay? And they will be cast out according to this scripture. Matthew chapter 7 shows us the Roman Catholics, the churches of Christ, the repent of your sins teachers like Ray Comfort and Wayne Levi Price and all those people, the Orthodox Christians, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Lordship Salvationists. You know, these people are saying, well, he's Lord, right? They're calling him Lord, Lord, and they submitted themselves unto him, and they're doing the works in his name, and yet they, like everybody else, have come short. Okay, the fact that they're trusting in that to get them to heaven is what causes them to be cast out. The only difference between them and the saints is the latter is justified by placing their faith in the Lord Jesus. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So this world sees the preaching of the cross as foolishness. But as we know, as it states a few verses earlier in verse 18 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the preaching of the cross is the power of God to us which are saved. And we are saved by our belief. Over and over again, the Bible says it's by faith, okay? If you want to be saved from your sins, don't look to religious rituals and doing good works and doing good deeds, but rather put your faith in the Son of God. That's what the Bible says. It's by faith. He saved them that believe. By grace you save through faith. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but by mercy he saved us. Okay? It's not by our own works, and yet so many religions teach that it is. They will be cast out from the kingdom of heaven on that day because they have not been justified. So when God looks at them, he still sees sinners. He doesn't have, he doesn't see their, their sins being washed away by faith because they're not trusting in God, they're trusting in themselves. So what becomes of those who are saved by faith? We've seen that there's more to it than just a first-time justification that we can lose based on the, the way we live, as many people present it. God promises eternal life to the saved, and I've already gone through the scriptures that say that. But the Bible also says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So because our sins have been taken away by Jesus through his death, burial, and resurrection, and because God has justified us, we have been delivered, which is another word for saved, from the wrath to come. God's anger, which is upon the wicked, is no longer upon us because we have been reconciled to God. Okay, before we were enemies, uh, I think it teaches that in Colossians chapter 1, before we were enemies in our mind by wicked works, but now we are reconciled to God uh, by the cross. And therefore, our punishment has been taken away from us as well, as it teaches in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 9 to 10. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. So here we see laid out plainly the matter of salvation, that we were dead, we were under the sentence of death, but it says that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. When we do trust him, according to the multitude of verses that we've already seen, and many more, we are delivered from this so great a death, as it calls it. We know from Revelation and Jesus' warnings in the gospel that this death is hell and the lake of fire. Because we have been delivered from our sins, we have also been delivered from the wrath of God and therefore also from God's punishment, God's sentence of death. Therefore, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 9 to 10, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. So we are no longer under God's wrath, but God has appointed for us to obtain salvation. 
Now the opposite of God's wrath, according to this verse, is salvation. To say that those who are saved can be under God's wrath is a contradiction of what the Bible clearly says. If we are saved, that means that God has saved us from wrath, as stated also in Romans 5.9. It says much more than, being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And therefore, now that we are saved, going back to 1 Thessalonians 5.10, whether we wake or sleep, that is, whether our bodies are alive or dead, we should live together with him. Now, where is Christ? In heaven. The Bible says that when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. The Bible says, No man hath ascended up into heaven, save he which came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. It says in 1 Peter 3.22 of Christ, it says, Who has gone into heaven and is in, on the right hand of God. Okay, so where is Christ? He's in heaven, on the right hand of God the Father. And according to the scriptures, if we have been saved, even when our body returns to the dust of the earth, which is called sleeping in the Bible, such as in Acts 760, uh, which says that when Stephen was stoned, he fell asleep. So when our bodies die, it says that we should live together with him. Why? Because we have eternal life. So Jesus said in John 10, 28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So those who have been saved meaning saved from their sins and saved from God's wrath and saved from death, they have eternal life so that when we die, we will not go to hell, but we will go to heaven. Okay? As it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, that being absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So when our spirit and our soul leaves this earthly tabernacle for the person who is saved, because we have everlasting life, okay, that part of us which continues to live goes to heaven. So let's recap. Why does that happen? Because if we believe on Christ, our sins are effectively remitted, and we are justified by the blood of Christ. So we are no longer sinners, and therefore do no longer deserve the condemnation of hell. God then imputes righteousness to us by that same faith without our works, and we are then born again, or regenerated and renewed by the Holy Ghost. Our dead soul is quickened with everlasting life. All of this means, together, that we are saved. And therefore will not go to hell, because we have been saved from death, but rather we will go to heaven. That is what the Bible teaches. So to say that we need to do anything else besides have faith in Jesus Christ, or to say that those who are justified can lose their salvation, or to say that faith cannot save you, or to rely on your own righteousness, is a heresy and denial of what the scriptures clearly teach. Over and over again, justification is by faith. Regeneration is by faith. Quickening is by faith. Salvation is by faith. It says it over and over again. Grace through faith. That's it. Nothing else. So, any church or teacher who teaches contrary to this is not teaching what the Bible says because you won't find a single verse in the Bible that says that we have to live a good life in order to go to heaven. Because, as I've just shown you with multitudes, dozens and dozens and dozens of scriptures, it's by faith. It's by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. So I hope that people out there who are confused on this can have a better understanding of the doctrine of salvation, of what takes place when we get saved, of why it is only by faith. Because of the fact that we can't hope to be justified by our works, because that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't outweigh our sins. So the fact that we are sinners means that we need somebody to step in our place, and that was Jesus when he died on the cross. And he took our sins, he paid for them, he died for them already, so that every sin which we have already committed, and every sin which we will commit, has already been died for. The punishment has already been paid. All we have to do is trust in him, and God gives us righteousness, and he makes us alive once again, so that we will be with him when we die, and when we go to heaven, and not go to hell. It's pretty clear in the scriptures, okay? So thank you everybody for watching. That's it for today. God bless you, and goodbye.